God, we just thank you this morning for your freedom. We just thank you that we get to come into this place and worship you freely. You are so good and you are so worthy of our praise. So we just lift you up this morning in everything that we do and we say, God, we want to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name.
sing it out. You guys lead. Your name is love. It's hope inside us. And, and so, Father, we just want to proclaim that today. We want everything we say here today, everything we do, lift you up and bring you honor and glory and praise. Because your word says that when we lift you up, you will draw men and women unto yourself. And, and Father, there's so many of us here today that just need a touch from you today. We need a word from you today. So have your way in this place. Have your way in our hearts. Let none of us leave here the same this morning. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen, amen. Well, turn to somebody near to you and give them a hearty hello. I don't even know what that means. A hearty hello. It just sounded cool. Well, good morning, good morning. Uh, for those of you I have not met yet, my name is Tony. I'm a youth pastor here at the well. I'm excited to be here this morning, um, we are just, uh, we have a great day planned for you. If you're a guest with us, we just want to say welcome. We are excited that you're here. We've been praying for you. We've designed a lot of this service specifically with you in mind. But should you need anything this morning, anything at all, I want to encourage you to find someone wearing one of the blue name tags. They're stationed throughout the campus. They're here to answer any questions, to point you in the right direction. They really want to help you. So honestly, if you need anything, let them. Let them help you. Uh, it would be a blessing to them. Uh, hopefully, you've already noticed that we're a people who love to worship. We, we love to sing and, and, and lift up God's name, and we do that just by singing. We do that through the preaching and teaching of God's word. Uh, listen, uh, this, this, you got to an amazing message that you're going to hear from Pastor Jerry this morning. Get ready to lean in. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but we also have an opportunity to worship through our generosity, through our giving. And if you're a guest with us here today, we want to let you know the service is a gift to you. But if you've come, if you're a weller and you've come ready to give of your tithes and offerings this morning, you know you could do that at any time throughout the service. Uh, there is an envelope in the seat back in front of you if you're giving cash. It's completely self-directed. Go ahead and use that envelope. Drop it in one of the boxes along the wall, and you'll be all set. If you'd like to give online, you could do that as well. Uh, all the instructions are on that same envelope. You can also go to our website at cometothewell.org forward slash give, and there's instructions on how to set that up there as well. Our, when we come together in our finances, in our generosity, it not only enables us to keep things going here at the well inside these walls and the ministry that we're doing week in and week out, but it also enables us to partner with amazing people, organizations and ministries throughout the world, nationally, uh, and, and here locally. And each week, we like to let you guys know about one of our ministry partners. And today, I'm really excited to share with you our ministry partner is uh, Pastor Chan. And um, Pastor Chan, I remember when I first saw this graphic, I thought, hey, you guys missed like putting this picture there. Uh, but there's a reason for that. Um, we, we're, we can't show uh, Pastor Chan's identity because he is in China, which is a country that is hostile to the gospel, and he is launching the underground church in houses and meeting spaces and places uh, in a very, very difficult area. And guys, if, if, if you've been reading, if you've heard anything, the church in Asia, the church in China is exploding right now. God is doing an amazing work, and Pastor Chan is going into this difficult place, but he's raising up leaders, and he's spreading the word and, and, and spreading the gospel in an area that desperately needs it. And so we're excited for what he's doing. The fruit is showing. We've got some pictures that we were able to see of meeting rooms that are just full, and, and God is just doing an amazing work. So this morning, uh, we want to pray not only for the gifts that are given, but we also want to pray for the work that Pastor Chan is doing in China. So pray with me. Father, we just thank you so much again for this opportunity that we have to come here and worship you. Father, we want to thank you for the gift that it is to be here in the United States where we can worship you and lift up your name publicly and, and, and without any fear. 
And so, Father, we know this morning that there are parts of the world where that isn't the case. In China, that isn't the case. And so, Father, we pray just protection over Pastor Chan and his work. We pray that you prepare hearts, Lord, for the people who are going to hear your word. Father, we pray that you would just, out of your abundance, bless him with your resources of, of people and finances and leaders, Lord, and favor, Lord, that you would give him favor with city officials and people, Lord, that, that your word would just burst forth in this place in, in, in China. So, Father, we just ask that you bless him. Bless the gifts that are given today, Lord. Have your way in this place. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning. morning. How's everyone doing? Good? Morning. Good. For those of you I haven't had the privilege of meeting yet, my name is Jerry and I'm the lead pastor here at the well. Thanks so much for coming and celebrating your faith with us today. Uh, you'll notice as you came in, uh, you should have all had one of these. If you didn't, you're probably sitting on it. So uh, everyone grab your little cards as you asked for it, kind of hold it up. Uh, what this is, is the week following Easter, or actually I take that back, two weeks following Easter, we are going to be starting a brand new series. It is entitled, You Asked For It, and uh, so we would love to hear uh, questions from you. They could be uh, specifically related to uh, an area of scripture or, or God and his workings with man. It might be something specifically about the church and who or how the church is supposed to be in the midst of our world. Uh, it could be something that is politically happening right now. And what we're going to be doing over that month is not only are we going to take some of the larger themes and turn them into our weekend services, uh, also different ones of the, the, the leaders and the, the elders and staff will actually be answering a lot of the questions uh, on social media throughout the month. So all month long you can be shooting in questions and, uh, and we're going to do that. So if you have uh, something that's just been rolling around in your mind for the last couple days, last few weeks, fill this out. You can drop these in any of the boxes on the way in and out of the auditorium. Uh, also, if you're not, uh, if you can't think of a question right now, and as soon as you leave and you're like, no, oh, I knew that would happen, don't worry. You can go on our app and right there where the, the sermon information is on that home page, on that drop uh, page, you can click on it. It says the same thing. You ask for it. And it takes you out. There's a place where you can enter a question online. So if that's easier, you can do that. Also, uh, just a reminder, this is the last week uh, in the first quarter of 2017. Next week starts our March to Easter. And there is no better time in the entire year uh, to invite your friends, your family, your co-workers, your neighbors, all the folks that you've tried to get to church in the past and, and maybe uh, it just hasn't worked out. And so Easter's always a great season to do that. We have got new invite cards for Easter. We'll be giving them to you the last couple weeks before Easter, but they are available now if you're interested with the service times uh, back at Well Informed. So you can, you can kind of check those out and take advantage of those and, uh, and it would be a huge service to us as well. All right, today we are in our last week in our series, The Promise, where we've been looking at this idea that ultimately Jesus is the promise of God, that he, he himself is the resident promise, the fulfillment of everything that God said, that everything that God hinted at, that everything that God claimed, it is all fulfilled for us in Christ. In fact, when the Apostle Peter was speaking to the church, he said that God chose Jesus to be our ransom, to be our sacrifice, before he even began to create or build the world. And it was only later, now, in these last days, 
that he has actually revealed Christ. So God, before time began, was basically working one plan with one character, one intent, one in nature, and that is consistent throughout all of time and everything that we see about God. God is unchanging at the core essence of who he is. So Jesus then was, Jesus is, Jesus will always be the promise of God. So when John was writing his gospel, his good news, his biography about the life of Jesus, he said this. He said, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, being the Word, came into the the world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, but even they rejected him. But to all who believe in him and accept him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. So, so the word became human and made his home among us. And he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son, and no one has ever seen God, but this unique one, the Word that became human, He Himself is God, and He's near to God's heart. He has been revealing God to us. So, since before time began, God had a plan that was that was centered on Him having a family entering into life with us to create an object for his affection that could receive his affection, that could reciprocate his affection and his love and enter into this divine community, this divine dance that he was already already in. And, and what we see is that the, if God doesn't change, then this idea that we sometimes have an Old Testament God, a New Testament God, and how God is working today begins to break down because God, God doesn't change. The same God, the same promises that we see, that we hear in the Old Testament are exactly what we see being fulfilled, being lived out in the life of Jesus. And those are the same things that we have access to today. And so we should be able to see these consistent threads in the nature, in the character, in the narrative, in the story of God. And so that's what we've been looking at over the last few weeks. We saw that God is present, that he never leaves us or forsakes us. We found that he is the covenant provider and the covenant keeper, that he's the promise giver and the promise keeper. And today we're going to look at the idea that God is our Savior. Now, one of the things that happens whenever you think about God as Savior is, even though it's a very biblical idea, sometimes it causes us to move or to think or to act or sort of position ourselves in kind of a non-biblical way. So someone says, well, God is our Savior. And we think, uh-oh, something bad's getting ready to happen. And we, we get this sort of image of hunkering down and just sort of trying to bear through whatever is going to happen. But that's not consistent with what we see happening over and over and over throughout biblical history. Instead, what we see is that the reality that God is more than able to save us has caused men and women to be audacious, to take uh, great leaps of faith, to be daring in their approach to life and to love and to Christ. And so our hope is not that we would hunker down in essence, but that we would run at our future with a profound sense of confidence and hope. And this is sort of the idea that launched us into Lent this year. We decided that rather than doing the traditional rhythm of giving something up over Lent, that the truth is, is that we have all given up enough due to sin or or sickness or self or the world or all the different things that this year we wanted to kind of take a different approach. And rather than giving something up for Lent, we were going to take something back. We were going to take ground. We were going to take back our dreams. We were going to take back our hopes. We were going to anticipate the God who can do anything to do just about anything in our lives. Because you absolutely cannot fail when you set out to live God's will, His purpose for your life. You can't, 
You can't fail, so let's run hard. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever prayed or said something like this? Um, God, if, if you'll just get me out of this, I will blank. How many, how many of you ever, you can be honest, I'm a, I'm a pastor. Okay, some, yeah, some, some of you. The rest of you, actually, let's just do this. This is probably easier and more honest. Everyone look at your neighbor. Yeah, you know they've, had, they've prayed, oh God, get me out. Just you look at them and you know, I mean, it may have been sometime in the last 12 days. And here's the truth. If, if you've ever prayed that prayer, you understand the need for God as a Savior. And so today we're going to be looking at a story that's found in Daniel chapter 3. We're going to be looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these are the patron saints of dumb people. I'm, I'm just kidding. That's, that's not true. We are totally on our own. No. So if you, have your, uh, if you have your internet devices, you can pull up your apps, and we're going to be looking at Daniel 3. If you're using our app, you know that uh, the notes and the, the verses are always provided there for you. The reality is, is that life is hard, and it is fraught with difficulties and frustrations and setbacks and even failure. And faith really is no different. And anyone who ever tries to tell you that it is or that it is supposed to be is actually trying to sell you something. Jesus actually said of himself when he was in the earth, in this life, you're going to have many trials and sorrows. Many, really? I mean, he couldn't have just said you're going to have trials and sorrows. He doubles down. You're going to have many trials and sorrows. But that isn't where he stops. He goes on to say, but I want you to take heart that I have overcome the world. And God isn't just saying to us, hey, you don't have to worry because in the midst of your struggle, I'll be there. And he will. He isn't just saying, hey, whatever it is you're facing, I am facing too and I am engaging too. And that's true. What Jesus, what God is promising is that in the end, you will be victorious. That you will win, that we win. And so God, God is all in on us. And he says to us, listen, when you go all in, I promise you're going to win. God is, is all in. So let's look at our, our, our story about our three Hebrew uh, children, really three Hebrew teenagers. So, so this is what happened. Let me just kind of set the background for you as you're getting there to Daniel 3. Um, Israel has been invaded by Babylon, and all of the best and the brightest, all the greatest, all the wealth, the resources of Israel has been carried off to Babylon. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, has taken um, all, of, all of the strongest men, all of the most beautiful women, all of the most talented artisans, all of the wisest of the sages, uh, and especially all of the young people, and he has conscripted them into his services into his military, into his building projects, and so on. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are three young men who have distinguished themselves to be men of wisdom, men of learning, men of knowledge. And so he has put them into his, his leadership team, into his, his counselors and advisors, into his wise men and magicians, and so on. And, and they have already, by, by Daniel chapter 3, they have already kind of distinguished themselves. But this has also made them sort of the object of some jealousy among some of the other leaders. So one day, Nebuchadnezzar decides that he's going to, based on a dream that he had had, he's going to erect this enormous gold statue in the valley that kind of represents him and his leadership, and that any time music plays at all in the kingdom, everyone is supposed to take a moment and just sort of nod, acknowledge, bow, worship for just a moment, uh, to this idol in acknowledgement of, of the great work that God is, is supposedly doing through Nebuchadnezzar. Well, the three Hebrew children, that's a violation of their law. They, they're not allowed to cast God into any form, and they're not allowed to worship any idol other than God. So there's no way that they could actually adhere to this new command. Well, the other wise men hear about it, and they go tattle to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, no, you guys don't understand. These are my boys, and we got this. So I'm just going to bring them in. It's all going to be fine. And so he brings him in, and he's like, guys, listen, there's this misunderstanding. We're just going to go through the paces. I'm going to have them play a song. You're going to bow to the statue. We're all going to go home, and these guys are going to know that they're just crazy. And so they, they start to play the song, and they're like, no, no, king, 
we're, we're, not, we're not doing it. And he says, what do you understand? We've got a rule now. If you don't bow to the statue, you have to, you have to dance in the furnace. It's one or the other. So I'm going to play the music. You're going to, you're going to bow. And they said, we're, we're not bowing. Well, now the king is angry. And he says, listen, guys, we've been friends. We, we've covered some good ground together. You don't do this now. You're going into the furnace. And in Daniel 3.16, it says this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to be crystal clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar flies into a rage. He was so angry, Scripture says, it contorted his face, and he ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times its normal temperature. And he has the men thrown in. The furnace is so hot that the guards who are casting these teenagers into the fire themselves die from the heat. Nebuchadnezzar is looking, and he's and he's expecting there to be screams and howls and all kinds of things, and nothing happens. You know, there's that, there's that weird anticlimactic moment where they throw him in and everyone dies, and it stops for a second. And they're all like, so, so now what was supposed to happen? I'm not sure. And they're kind of looking, and Nebuchadnezzar said, we threw three guys in there, right? I mean, it was just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. None of the guards, like, went in too, did they? Like, no, no, it was just the three of them. And watch what he says in verse 25. He says, look. Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound. They're just walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth one looks exactly like God. God shows up. God is all in in this story. And then God begins to kind of show off. Let's look at our next verse. in uh, Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace, and he shouts, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here. Now, I think it's funny that he says all three of their names because I think he's trying to be clear. He doesn't want the fourth guy to come out. He's like, <laughs> he's like hey, guys, come on out. Just leave your friend. He's probably fine. So he calls and he asks for him to come out. Let's keep reading. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego step out of the fire. And then the high officers, the officials, the governors, the advisors, they all crowd around them. They saw that the fire hadn't touched them. Not a hair on their head had been singed. Their clothes were not scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. And it's such a beautiful picture. It's a promise. That God will show up, and when he does, he's going to show himself powerful. He's going to show himself mighty, and there's not going to be any confusion about what happened or who did it. And that's exactly what we see in the life of Jesus. So not only was God all in, but Jesus was all in. In fact, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus just speaks to his own mission in life. And he says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those things which are lost, those people who are lost. My whole mission in coming was that role, that title of being Savior. And I, I came in the midst of this confusion, in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this furnace, in the midst of this world, so that those things could experience salvation. That I would be there in their midst and that they would see and experience me. And what's interesting is that, that Jesus, uh, in the life of Jesus, it isn't just that God shows up in the form of Jesus, but that the life of Jesus and God actually create this same dance for us as well, in which Jesus is dependent on God, and God is showing up in the life of Jesus. Also, we see this same attitude, this same heart, this same response in Jesus that we saw in the three Hebrew children. 
In Matthew chapter 26, it's at the very end of Jesus' life, and he's just had the Last Supper with his disciples, and he is telling them at the end of dinner, listen, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me, and it's going to happen soon. And the disciples are freaking out, and they're crying, and Jesus says, listen, this is what I want to do from now until they come get me. I just want to go pray. Would some of you guys go pray with me? And he takes his disciples and he goes over to the garden at Gethsemane, which, is, which was a, an olive grove and, a, and an olive press. And he says to them, listen, you guys wait here and pray and I'm going to go on just a little bit further. And, and scripture records for us Jesus's prayer. And in Matthew 26, verse 39, it says this, Jesus says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. So notice that Jesus is saying, listen, I, I, I'm a savior, but I'm in need of a savior. If there's any way I can get out of this, please let that happen. Yet, I want your will to be done more than I want my own will to be done. More than I want to be saved out of whatever is getting ready to happen. I want the big victory, not the short victory. Scripture says he goes back over to check on his disciples. This guy is like right on the, he is on the cusp of being killed, executed in the most horrific way. And he goes over and he finds his disciples and they're all just knocked out. And before you're too hard on them, remember they've been up all night and they were crying all night. You know how like you cry, you just like get like crying exhausted. And they had cried themselves out, and he goes over and he shakes him. He's like, guys, please try to stay awake with me. I don't want to go through this alone. I'm, I, 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 this is horrible. This is terrifying. And verse 42 says that Jesus went back off to pray by himself again, and again he prays. My father, if this cup can't be taken away from me unless I drink it, then your will be done. In other words, he's saying again, listen, if there is another way, I'm still open to it. But if there's not, I, I totally get it. And here's what I want you to see. God shows up in the form of Christ, but he also shows up for Christ. And God shows off in the same way that he did in the furnace for the three Hebrew children. He does in the midst of the furnace in the life of Jesus. In John chapter 12, Jesus says this. He says, now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason that I came. So this is my, my prayer. Father, Bring glory to your name. And God thundered back from heaven to Jesus' prayer. And he said, I've already brought glory to my name. And I'll do it again. And here's what I want you to understand. It was in the furnace that God got the glory. It was in the struggle of Jesus' life that Jesus is glorified, but also that God is honored. And so God gains glory through Jesus, but Jesus gains glory and victory too. Because it's only because Jesus was willing to go to the cross that he was able to experience the resurrection. That he was able to experience that elevation of life that we are still moving towards. And here's what I want you to understand. The promise of victory, the promise of a savior does not mean we won't pass through things. It means we absolutely will. You don't get a victory without a battle. Do you understand that? We don't need a savior without suffering. So the whole point that God is savior indicates to us that we're going to have struggles, that we're going to have suffering. But it's in that place where God is glorified in us and through us. Watch what happens in our story in Daniel chapter 3, verse 28. After the Hebrew children had come out, Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue his servants that trusted him. They defied the king's command. They were willing to die rather than to serve or worship any god except their own God. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, wherever, whatever their race, their nation, their language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb. Their house will be turned into a heap of rubble because there is no God who can rescue like this God. So God is all in. Jesus is all in. And it creates a way, it creates an opportunity for us to really be all in. I remember, um, 
I, I like outdoor enthusiastic kind of stuff. I like uh, adrenaline stuff. So over the years, um, my family, we've, we've parachuted and whitewater uh, rafted and whitewater kayaked and, and we rock climb and hike and we do all kinds of reckless manner of craziness to, 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 to try to get to heaven faster. And I remember one time, it was the very first time I ever took the boys whitewater kayaking, and, and they weren't ready, and, and the water level I checked the night before was, was at a certain level, and it was kind of headed down, and I thought, you know what, it's probably going to be, it's going to be tough for the boys, but it's going to be manageable. And, um, and so when we actually got there, it had rained high up in the mountains that night, and, um, and so it wasn't on my forecast. And the water had actually risen, and, and now it was at the peak of its difficulty, of its uh, danger, of its technical uh, rating, and so on. And so I, 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 I looked at the, the course, and I talked to the guy, and I was like, boys, I don't know. And my boys, they're, they're always up for a challenge, and they're like, dad, we can do it. And I was like, yeah, and that's what, it's what every dad wants to hear, you know, you're like, yeah, and you're talking to your two-year-olds, and you're like, yeah, let's be crazy, you know, and, and so I load the boys up in their tiny little kayaks, and we put off in water that, honestly, none of us should have been in, and it took us, I think, about two series of rapids to realize we had made a serious mistake, but we were in a slot canyon. You couldn't get out. So we would get to a series of rapids, and we'd pull over, and I would help the boys portage around the water. Then I would hike back up and get in my boat, and I would come through. And then as soon as I came through, they would jump back in the water, and, and, and we would kind of do this. And there was one particular place where the river fell away in a really weird way, and Isaiah was kind of leading, and he'd gotten up and, 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 and landed, and I came up and landed, and Elijah missed it and got swept down river in a place that was undercut, and the fall was severe, and... And it was just, it was an incredibly dangerous situation. And when we finally got Elijah, he had lost everything literally but his shorts. <laughs> he had lost his helmet, his paddle, his boat, his shoes. I, I mean, he had literally lost everything. So now it's spring. The water is like crazy high. The temperature, the water temperature is like 34. It's barely over freezing. We were just in shorty wetsuits. And, and, and it's just, it's a struggle. And I remember as we were getting through that, there was one point late in the day, and this helicopter came flying over, and one of the boys was like, hey! And I was like, no, stop! Because all I could see is that they were going to send help, and that would be like all the kids' college fund, just shunk. It's like, those rescues aren't free, stop it! We will figure this out. And here's the truth. The Hebrew children said this, God is able to save me. He's more than able. And I'm convinced that he will rescue me. But I love what they say in verse 18. In verse 18 they say, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we want to be clear. We will never forsake our love, our confidence, our faith, our conviction in our God we'll never do it I remember and you guys have heard me tell the story over and over but I remember when Taylor got real sick the second time and we were back in the hospital with her and I was praying and I was saying God if you'll just get me out of this this one time I will I'll tell everyone how great you are I'll tell everyone how faithful you are I'll tell everyone how powerful you are and I just heard him say to me, but what are you going to tell him if I don't? And I love that heart. My God is able. My God will rescue, but even if he doesn't. That's what Jesus said, isn't it? When he said, I don't want to go through this. This is hard if there's another way, but, but I don't want my way. I want your way. Hebrews 11.6 says if we would if we would come to God if we would please God then we have to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him it is impossible to please God without faith 
anyone who wants to come to him. They have to believe that God exists, that he's real, that he's personal, that he's present. And that he rewards those who sincerely seek him, that he is good, and that he has a good outcome for you, regardless what you might be passing through today. And when things don't go our way, when they don't go the way we we had hoped, when they don't go the way that we had mentally planned, we sometimes impugn God, but what God is trying to do is, is win a larger victory in us and through us. And I want, you to, I want you to hear something, especially those of you who are struggling today, and you've been praying, God, if you'd get me out of this. Sometimes God moves to protect you, to get you out, to get you safe. But sometimes God moves to perfect you, to leave you there, to be purified, to be cleansed, to be strengthened. And wherever you are today, whatever you've passed through so far this year or whatever you will pass through in these coming months, God is still our Savior. He has been since time began. If he doesn't do something immediately the way you think, don't give up on him or your hope or your dream. Because perhaps he's perfecting something in you for a larger victory. But that victory, that win, it's fixed. God has promised, and the promise of God, we're all fulfilled in Christ. Would you stand with me? Maybe one of the most beautiful things in the story is that in Daniel chapter 3, verse 30, our story ends like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Their willingness to stand in a hard place, not only did it bring God glory, but in the end it also brought them glory. A win on the backside, but something that they could experience and express within their lifetime. Wherever you are, please don't give up. Whatever you're facing, don't think about finding an easy way around or out or under. Stand in that place with the confidence, with the conviction that the same God who stood with those three Hebrew teens in a fire in ancient Babylon is the same God who died on a cross and rose again and that same God has brought you to this place because he has somewhere else that he's still taking you this last element in our service is our encounter time because we want you to encounter Christ and his Holy Spirit for yourselves To help you with that, we'll be passing the elements of communion, the body and the blood of Christ today. We ask you just to to hold that for just a moment. We'll actually be taking it together. But as you stand there holding the elements of Christ in your hand, would you just stop and pause and ask yourself, God, is my attitude that you, you can rescue, you will rescue, but even if you don't, is that my heart? Am I prepared for whatever is coming next? Am I bringing you glory and honor how I'm standing right here in the midst of my storm? Am I experiencing and expressing the saving nature of our God? Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you so much for today and this time. We thank you, God, that you save, that you are able to rescue. Lord, we just ask that you would have your way in us. God, that if there's a way for us to move out of these times of pain, out of these times of struggle, God, that if you could heal our children and heal our marriages and heal our homes and heal our land, God, we want that now, immediately. But God, if you've got a larger plan that you're working to perfect us, to teach us to stand in this place to bring you glory and honor, so that the saving nature of our God would be clearly evident in our lives. We love you, Lord. We bless you. We thank you. It's in your precious name we pray. And everyone said amen. Bring
very night that Jesus was betrayed, just prior to going to the garden, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. The scripture promised that by the stripes that Jesus bore in his body, by the suffering that he bore in his body, we could experience wholeness and health, peace in ours and in this life. So I'm going to ask everyone, just close your eyes and bow your heads. Don't look around. This isn't... If you're going through something today, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's in your finances, maybe it's with your family, your kids, a wayward son, a wayward daughter. Maybe you know that there's something in your life and it's got to it's gotta change and you need God to move. Would you acknowledge that today? Would you just lift your hand for just a moment up to God? You can put it up and back down. Just let God know that in this moment you're giving that thing to Him. Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift of your body, that you were made human, that you became flesh so that in this life we could know your mercy, your loving kindness, your faithfulness. So God, even as we participate in your body, let us experience and know your peace. God, that whether you're going to take us through this or whether you're going to perfect us in the midst of it, that we know that your nature, your character is fixed and so is our outcome. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread. In the same way, at the end of the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant and it's poured out for you in my blood so that your sins can be forgiven. Because here's the truth. Until we've made Jesus not only Savior, but Lord, we will never really experience the confidence or the peace that he wants for us. That it's in acknowledging that through Christ and Christ alone that I enter into any kind of real life that ultimately gives me hope. So if you're here this morning and you realize that you need a savior to save you from the brokenness of your life, the sin of your life, the darkness of your life, I'm gonna ask everyone to close their eyes, bow their heads, and if that's you, you know you need a savior. Would you raise your hand? You can put it up and right back down. Thank you. Would you make this prayer your prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blood that you shed to save us, God, not just from our struggles, but from ourself, from our sin, from our sickness, from the brokenness and the darkness of our life. And God, there's no way we could have gotten there on our own, and we acknowledge that. So today we pause to cry out to a Savior, to invite you to be Lord, to reign in my heart and mind, to begin to organize my life to your will. God, that my prayer would become like yours, not my will, but yours be done. So God, even as I participate in this cup, let it go down and not just cleanse the sin, but reshape me into the very form of life itself, that I might know you. In Jesus' name. Let's partake of the cup. Father, we just thank you so much that you have not left us alone, that you're all in, that you sent your son to be all in. Now, God, help us as we approach this second quarter, as we move towards Easter, to prepare our hearts for a great victory in the resurrection, to believe for the impossible, to stand wherever it is you have for us today, God but to know with absolute certainty that you're going to bring about a great victory in our lives. Everyone said amen. Let's just sing this together one more time.
Father, we just worship you and thank you. God, we love you. We know that you never leave us, you never forsake us, that you've given us great promises. And then, Lord, you bring them about, that you're with us in the midst of the storm to perfect us and to protect us, to bring about a perfect end. God, we love you. We praise you. Can we just give the Lord an applause? If you said that prayer with me, accepting Christ as your Savior for the first time, or maybe just the first time in a long time, we would love to have permission just to partner with you in your journey of faith. If you'd grab one of our Connect cards, either from the seat back in front of you or from the service guides that you got on your way in, and give us just your name and email, that's all we need. About halfway down, it says, I'm making a commitment today. It doesn't matter which box you check. But if you check it, then there's two things you can do. The first thing, we would love for you to come grab someone with one of the blue name tags. Come grab me or one of the leadership. You could slip into the prayer room. We would love to have a chance just to pray, just to seal that decision with you in your heart. And then the other thing is you can go back to Well Informed. We actually have a New Believer's Bible. It's a gift for you. It's the, the entire Bible in everyday language, so it's really, really easy to read. And it's loaded with extra information that we all need in our journey of faith. These are completely free. They are yours. Please take advantage of them back at Well Informed. If you're a guest with us this morning, thanks so much for coming, coming out on spring break. We appreciate you being here. Um, we would love to connect with you. If you would fill out one of our connect cards in the area marked new here, again, just need your name and email. And there's a couple things you can do. If you've got to uh, get out of here quick, we understand. You can drop them in the boxes on your way in and out of the auditorium. Otherwise, there's a guest reception upstairs, top of the stairs on the right, lead pastor's office, my office. Some of the staff will be up there. I'll be up there in a minute gives us a chance just to put a face to the name, and we have a gift for you today just to say thanks for coming. And then we're going to shoot you an email this week just letting you know ways that you can get involved, ways that we would love to be able to minister to you and kind of open that dialogue. If you're ready for a next step or if you have not yet been a part of Growth Track here at The Well, you need to be a part of Growth Track. Every week following our services at 1045 and 1230 up in our training center, we have the Growth Track. Each week, moves along with the, uh, the steps in our journey. So week one is step one, knowing God. This is week four. Week four, step four is all about making a difference, really understanding how God made you so that you can find that place of true purpose, true transcendence in your life. You don't want to miss it. It's upstairs. Uh, at the, the 1045, we've got snacks. 1230, we have lunch. So you, it's, it's awesome. You don't want to miss it. If you want to stay in this atmosphere, right through the door on your right, my left, is our prayer room. We have a family that will check in, see if you need prayer, or just give you some space to pray on your own. But before we head in our different directions, would you just raise your hands and receive a blessing? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace to know that God sees you wherever you are, that he is with you whatever you are going through and that he has a victory in store for you and your family if you don't lose heart. And everyone said amen. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to invite a friend.